second light came on? Oh, yeah, I noticed. Yeah. Just turn it on. It's a little too much. Remember this one. So good morning. Uh, before we get started with our next talk, I want to do so, a couple of announcements. Uh, first off, uh, welcome back. If you, this is the first time at ShmooCon, you've probably never heard this before, but we sell a large number of t-shirts every year. And again, uh, the, the term sell is a misnomer. All of the t-shirt sales that we do are entirely for donation. We take, we buy the t-shirts as the conference. Uh, and all of the money that you give us for t-shirts goes directly to charity for a number of really good charities. So please go buy some t-shirts. All of the money that you give us goes directly to charity, 100% of that. We also have bags from, last, uh, from previous conferences as well as what we uh, call bags of crap. So t-shirts of past conferences as well as something interesting like a water bottle or other interesting uh, stuff that were in past, uh, past bags that we gave out. Um, in addition to that, uh, you all are at the far end of our speaker hallway. If you go to the, f the exact opposite end of the hall, um, we have a number of other opportunities going on beyond just talks. So as an example, uh, Hack Fortress is going on all day. Uh, we, if you're interested in becoming a licensed ham radio operator, we have people that are doing stu uh, studying for that. And we'll be doing uh, the licensing exams will happen this weekend, uh, and a number of the lock picking village, if you want to learn how to pick locks, uh, pick handcuffs, uh, that's available down that hallway. If you are staying at the Hilton, so if you're staying here at this Hilton and you did not use the ShmooCon registration code when you booked your hotel room, please send an email to info at shmoocon.org with your last name and your reservation ID. So one of the reasons we're able to make this conference uh, affordable is that this space is partially funded by your hotel reservations and the more people that we use our code the less it costs us to run the conference so if you registered for this hotel and you're staying here and you didn't use our registration code please give us your your reservation ID so we can reduce the, the cost of the hotel for us and that'll make the, the conference continue to be uh, relatively affordable for next year uh, all right, so before we get started, I have a few things to give away from our sponsors. Um, of course, uh, I'm not going to just throw them out in the audience. I'm going to ask them some trivia questions. So can anybody tell me the difference between SSL and TLS? All right, so that's, that's close enough. Here, you can have a, uh, a power adapter. You want to come up and grab that. 
So unfortunately, you're going to have to trust this power adapter. It has some USB plugs, so you can charge with that. Unfortunately, it's made in China. Ah. All right, uh, and of course, I have a nice notebook. It's a captain's log from the United Federation of Planets. So who can tell me the number of, you know, of course, I'm like 12. Who can tell me the number of moons that Uranus has? Can anybody tell me the number of your moons that Uranus has? No. <laughs> Nobody can tell me the number of moons that Uranus has? It's 27. Who said 27? Somebody can Google. Come up and get yourself a, a captain's log. <laughs> so if you want cool uh, vendor swag, uh, you should read up on space trivia. Congratulations. All right, so uh, without wasting any more of your time, I'm sure you actually want to hear the presenters talk about what they're talking about. So please give a warm welcome to John and Jeff and let them get started. Hi, I'm John. I'm Jeff. Um, you can find the code for this at this uh, GitHub link. Um, and uh, hopefully on Monday, I'll have the slides posted there. So if you don't get a quick uh, picture, don't worry about it. Um, so before I start talking about JAW 3, I think uh, it's important to take a quick look at uh, how SSL works, just to get a quick overview. Um, so in this diagram here, you have a, a client system on the left, server on the right, and in the middle, you have your NIDs or whatever. And traditionally, um, that would just see a SSL connection with a source IP and a destination IP, and it's encrypted in the middle. Um, but all right, thanks. Uh, but if you're if you're lucky, maybe you will have uh, some certificate information in there. But there's actually a lot more that you can get out of the uh, initiation of the SSL session. So to go back to the beginning, first the client sends a send. Uh, server responds sin ACK, client responds ACK, then the, immediately following the TCP three-way handshake, the client will send a SSL hello packet saying, hi, I would like to talk in SSL. And if the server uh, has an SSL server, it's responding in SSL, it will respond with a server hello packet. Um, so we're going, and if it doesn't, then it'll just respond with a fin packet and the session's closed. But the client still sends the, uh, the hello packet. So it goes sin, sin ACK, ACK, hello, hello and then they start talking in SSL. Uh, but we're gonna look at that client hello packet, that, are, uh, that packet immediately after the TCP three-way handshake. This is what it looks like. I got two different uh, uh, clients up here, but the key fields to look for, um, they look similar. However, the client on the left-hand side uh, supports 13 Cypher suites. The client on the right-hand side has 19 on the left. Uh, it has uh, extension length of 124 on the right, it's 141. So they look similar, but they're actually not. Um, so for an example, let's look at Microsoft Edge. Uh, it supports 19 Cypher suites and it's Hello Packet and has an extension length of 107. Here's the Drydex malware, Banking Trojan. It supports 21 Cypher suites, even more than a web browser, but uh, has a lot fewer uh, extensions. And TrickBot malware, uh, 12 Cypher suites and even fewer extensions. Um, and if we dive into those, uh, those Cypher suites and the order that they appear, the Microsoft Edge browser uh, will go from most secure to least secure. That's how it orders its Cypher suites. Whereas something like the TrickBot malware um, will go from least secure to slightly more secure, then more secure to least secure, and then it, it's all over the place, uh, which is interesting. So that gives us the idea that, well, we can fingerprint these clients based on uh, the TLS or SSL version, either works, um, and uh, the list of Cypher suites and the order that they appear in, the list of extensions and the order that they appear in, and uh, for added complexity, we can look at the elliptic curves and the elliptic curve point formats in the order that they appear. So, let's see if I can talk loud enough. Good. Uh, that's uh, Wireshark. Yep. <laughs> so the SSL TLS uh, analysis is not new. So a lot of times 
you're going to see, like, Ivan back in 2009, he was looking at the ciphers and trying to figure out what's connecting to his network and identifying what type of things are connecting. And he noticed that the Googlebot only had four ciphers in it, which was unique. It was much different from some of the other browsers. So the next thing we started looking at was, OK, what, wh who's already done some of this, and what can we use? And of course, let's be closer. Oh, sorry, thank you. <laughs> Lee Brotherson said, you know, he's, he put together a tool. It's a standalone tool that j outputs a bunch of information about the, the TLS hello packet. And we're just like, this is awesome. It's great. It gives us information that we want, but it doesn't work in our tool set. When we saw this in 2015, we were like, oh, this is perfect. Uh, we wanted to use this. But it, it was a standalone tool, and the fingerprints that it produced were very large, and it just didn't work in our environment. So we had to come up with something that would work in our environment. So some of the requirements that we had, it had to be something that we could in integrate into our tool sets, obviously, because if, if it's something we can't put in there, we can't get it out across all of our example network, which is very large. Our, it has to be diag um, agnostic to the destination. It has to be able to be unique to the client application. And we went back and forth on how unique, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then it has to be easy to create, something that we can do in multiple uh, tools, something that is easily shareable. Uh, it's, some of the fingerprints that we saw were, were very large, so we had to figure out how do we get it so we could trade these things and share them out. And then it can be consumed by any tool, whether it's an IDS or if it's a SIM or it's a search engine, whatever it is, we've got to be able to use it in these, in these tool sets. So let's take a look at how we generate the TLS, the JAW3 string. And as John alluded to, we, we take the client hello, <coughs> uh, the client version first. And then we take the cipher suites, and the cipher suites are in the order that they're seen. And then we take the extensions that are all in the order that they were seen. And then we take the elliptical curves that are supported in the order that they're seen. And then we take the elliptical point formats. And everything has to be as they're seen, and it's very important that we don't mess around with that because, as John said, you know, they've got uniqueness in how they're, in how they're ordered and implemented. So. The, the string itself can get very large. There's upwards of over 300 a, different ciphers that are supported. So we've got to be able to have something that we can share. So we did MD5 hash, and we can take a huge long string, put it down to 32 characters, which uh, are handled by a lot of different tool sets already. So what happens if there's something that's not in the fingerprint string? Like the, this, this example is the extensions are not there. We simply just leave them null, put the delimiter in, MD5 hash it, and we have the unique string for that one. So this is what it looks like. No matter how complex the string is, if it's 300, you know, if we, if we were to take a client, build a client, and shove every cipher in there, we'll be able to say it's 32-bit string, and that's how we can run with it and detect on it. So it's very unique for some of these browsers. For Tor clients, it's very unique. It's very obvious. Uh, some malware families are, are there. And the big question is, why do we try and, and do this? The infrastructure of a lot of these places are very fluid. They're easily changed. You can change domains. You can change IPs. You can change your certificates. But once you get into the client application and the tools that they use, it's a lot harder for them to actually change. Or well, it depends on the complexity. Some of them just don't think at that level, you know, I need to change my tool setting. So, as we move up this stack, it gets harder for them to change, and that's why we focus so much on identifying the tools. There we go. Yep. Cool. I'm going to just use this mic now. Uh, so now that you know what JAW3 is, uh, welcome to Profiling, Detecting All Things SSL with JAW3. JAW3 was written by John Oltaus, Jeff Atkinson, and Josh Atkins. Hi, I'm John Oltaus. I do detection and I like experimenting with things. Right now I'm experimenting with a late title card during a conference presentation. Um, I'm Jeff Atkinson. I do mostly deployments um, of our sensor grid and I also do some detection and threat analysis. Uh, we're going from working on deploying from a couple dozen servers to several hundred. So we're really working on scaling out. 
And unfortunately, Josh could not be with us. He's stuck on the West Coast. Uh, so what are we going to talk about today uh, in the rest of this talk? Uh, we're going to talk about mapping JAW3 fingerprints to client applications, running JAW3 in a large corporate network, detecting malware with JAW3, detecting pen testers with JAW3, because that's fun, uh, detecting targeted threat actors with JAW3, utilizing the JAW3 string for hunting and analysis, and then uh, we're going to announce JAW3S, yes, JAW3 for the server hello packet, so not just for the client, and then how can you get JAW3 today? What, what products are running it today where you can just start using it? Um, so first, uh, mapping JAW3 to client application. Yeah, you want to use this one? Yeah, I'll use this one. Okay. Hopefully this will be easier to hear me. Yeah because I move around a lot when I talk. So the first thing that happens when you put JAW3 on your network and you put in your tool set, you see tons of hashes. And that can make your eyes bleed and your servers melt. So we had to figure out how do we get as much known information as possible, as quickly as possible. And Trisul put together a tool that took Lee Brotherson's um, fingerprints, converted them to JAW3 hashes, and we were able to start with that tool set. And it worked out really well. It got us a, a big step forward. Next thing is we had to de decide on our example network, how exactly can we get as much information as possible, as quickly as possible. So we took our host base logging and we combined our client applications and their network logs with our, with our network logging and the JAW3s that are associated there. And we're able to build out our list of what we've seen. And we posted this on that, that GitHub link so you can take a look and utilize it. So Along with uh, a link to the, uh, to the Trizzle, uh, is it Trizzle, Trizzle, Trizzle? I don't it's know. It's something. Okay. So it, it gives, you're going to hopefully save a lot of headache. Um, but there is, you know, there's some abnormalities in here that you're going to have to keep an eye out for. Because uh, depending on how your host base logging is, if it's just saying this is the file name and this is the network traffic, that file could be Internet Explorer with something shoved in it, and it's not really the, the right process. So... There's some nuances there you got to keep an eye out for. So hopefully this will give you a head start and you won't have as much of a headache. So once we have all of this information in, we can start profiling systems. So for example, what we have on the, the screen here is this laptop. John's laptop, as you can tell, yep. he does a lot of browsing of the internet. It's and all he also, in the cloud. It's all in the cloud. So. It's a cloud. <laughs> so... So we can, we can start looking at systems that we know. And one of the things that's really important here is that if you have a very controlled environment, you'll be able to see and know per system and what deviations there are. If you're on an IT or corporate network, um, that's going to be a whole different can of worms because everybody installs everything that they can. So, so it's, uh, it's important to understand, like, this, we're mapping these... Hey, how's it going? So this mapping uh, of client applications, this is just with the network traffic. There's no, there's no uh, endpoint that's producing these right, right here uh, in this example. This is just, uh, there's a network sensor uh, with JAW3 running and then some, some mappings that we've added into it. And uh, this is what it's able to uh, deduce, right? And it's, and it's absolutely accurate because it's my laptop and I know what I'm running and, and I, it's mainly Chrome and then some other weird things. So on a large example network, there's uh, some things that we can take away from here. And for this example network, we're going to see that almost 50% is just web traffic from browsers, specifically Chrome. Now there's one uh, takeaway here is that we're going to see Chrome is on here multiple times. And as John's going to talk about, there's some nuances on how the JAW3 is created and, and how it can, and, you know, what the client, how it connects out to the server makes a difference. So we got... Firefox is like 2.8%. Uh, um, a lot of a uh, lot of developers out here, so there's a lot of things we can take away. A lot of Apple. Now, another thing we can do is we can pivot on what type of tr what type of domains clients are going out to. Here, m.google.com is for mobile devices, so we can take a look and see that 90% of over 90% of this traffic is Apple clients. So and we can guesstimate iPhones. that it's iPhones, yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot that we can take away based on how you look at the data. Yeah, yeah here you want to. Very good. Uh, so uh, just randomly looking on this example network uh, for my PC master race brethren, um, steampower.com, and of course the, uh, the first number one thing that's connecting to that is Steam over OSX, followed by Google Chrome. So 
you know, people are just browsing the forums or whatever. Just thought it was interesting. Um, let's talk about malware and sandboxes. Uh, so it's important. So one of the things um, when looking at JAW 3 that a lot of people would like to do, and myself included, is uh, to throw malware into sandboxes that can spit out JAW 3 strings. But it's important to remember that uh, operating systems have uh, APIs that connections can go through. So it's important to, f to baseline your sandboxes uh, so that you understand what is the operating system API and what is the malware that you're trying to, to detect. So uh, at this GitHub link, uh, Bradford uh, wrote basically it's, a, it's an executable um, that just connects out over all the different Windows sockets uh, and therefore will produce your baseline, all your different uh, Windows socket uh, uh, JAW 3s. Um, and so there's Windows 10, Windows 2016, and, and like I said, we'll, we'll release these slides, so don't worry about it. Um, but so with this baseline, then you can say if you drop malware in and it produces this one of these JAW 3s, then you know which Windows API it's communicating through. If it doesn't produce one of these JAW 3s, then it's producing its own JAW 3. It's just connecting out to, to the Internet on its own, in which case that JAW 3 may be unique enough to just throw onto your blacklist, depending on your environment. So I want to talk a little bit about Metasploit, but before we get into Metasploit with JAW 3, I want to take you on a, a little story, a little journey about my experience with uh, trying to detect Metasploit over SSL. So a while ago, this is what Metasploit's randomly generated cert looked like. Uh, it's obviously randomly generated, um, and it had hard-coded country code equals US, and then the L field uh, in blue there, that's supposed to be the, uh, the, uh, the name of the city, right, for the cert. Um, and it's just random text, uppercase and lowercase. So how do we detect that? And I, I came up with this idea, uh, a lowercase character followed by two uppercase characters. Well, it's supposed to be a US city name. What US city names have a lowercase character followed by two uppercase characters? And the only one's Washington, DC, if you don't use a space, but that's easy to whitelist. So detection was actually really easy. I talked about this at Nova Hackers a couple years ago, and <laughs> immediately after talking about it, this guy, HDM uh, made a change to the code. <laughs> um, <laughs> so he wanted to change the randomly generated cert to match the snake oil certificate of Ubuntu 14.04. Snake oil certificate is when you go to Ubuntu and you just say, I need an SL cert, and it just generates one. That's what he wanted to emulate. Uh, so I was like, all right, HD so called M, <laughs> let's do this. So here's his code, and it's actually really cool. Uh, he's randomizing the, the length and time that the, uh, or the beginning point at which their certificate is valid from and to, and then uh, a bunch of other things. Um, and this is what it looks like in Bro. Uh, so Snake Oil cert on the, on the left, which was what he was trying to emulate, the Metasploit cert on the right. And you can see it, it looks very similar, except for the Snake Oil cert was always shine, signed with SHA-1, and Metasploit, I guess he, HD wanted to be secure with signing with SHA-256, um, which was different. And then, of course, the uh, Snake Oil cert had hostname.domain, uppercase characters, a period, and Metasploit cert was all lowercase. And so it was actually really easy to detect, and this was my bro script for it. Um, and it's, it was literally these three lines was basically the, the detection for it. Well, of course, it's not going to remain the same. Um, and so on October 5th of last year, uh, our Whitcroft, uh, made an update to it, and he basically combined the two of the previous uh, uh, methods for generating a cert. Um, and, uh, and so this is what it looked like. You could probably detect it this way with, uh, with these uh, regex matches on the subject and issuer. However, I wasn't able to fully test that because 20 days ago it was changed again. Um, and this time there's actually a bug in the code because they have a C equals and then a new line C equals US. And so it's, uh, it's still easy to detect. But the, now you get to the... So the problem, this is changing too often, <laughs> and I can no longer, it's no longer viable to just keep watching it and keep writing new detection. So can we detect Metasploit um, not worrying about the, the cert anymore? So Metasploit over SSL, and who cares what the cert is today? Uh, so I did some testing, and uh, I ran three different uh, sessions with Meterpreter, different, different ways of executing Meterpreter. And uh, this is what it looks like in Moloch, by the way. If you don't know what Moloch is, it's this amazing open source, full packet capture tool written by the guys, local at AOL, or is it 
what are they now? Oath, oh. Oath, yeah. yes. Uh, and you can find out more at molo.ch. Uh, another thing that's great about this is Moloch has JAW3 built into it right now. So if you go get Moloch, you can play with JAW3 immediately. It's, it's right there. Anyways, this is what it looks like on, on Moloch. I'm going to zoom in here so it's a little easier to read. Uh, I did three different sessions. Uh, this is from Interpreter Reverse HTTPS. Uh, the lines in black are the stager, and the lines in gray are the payload. And so you can see the stager is between 160 and 170 bytes each time, and it's only lasting for a second. And then, the, of course, the payload can last for as long as your interpreter session lasts for. So I'm going to zoom in here. You can see that uh, the stager has one jaw 3, and the payload has a different jaw 3. Uh, interpreter actually utilizes a Windows API to communicate out. Um, but I don't know about this. I don't think the stager does. That looks pretty unique, actually. Um, but notice it's also 165 bytes. So uh, what about reverse win HTTPS? So not just reverse HTTPS, reverse win HTTPS. Uh, this is for specifically, I would assume, to bypass these types of detections uh, because it's taking the, the stager and the payload and having them both go through that same Windows API. So it's good to look at. However, you can still write detection for this. Because a stager is always, no matter what it is, it's always 160 through 170 packets. Um, and then the payload immediately following is, uh, is that Windows API. Um, and then so there's, I got two different detection mechanisms here, one without, one where, where it's just going to an IP address and one where it's going to a server name. Um, so I might write a, uh, a bro script or something to detect this, throw it up on the GitHub. Um, but moving on, uh, PowerShell exploit kits, uh, like Empire, right? Well, how do you detect that? Because it's going through PowerShell. It turns out that Windows does not natively uh, communicate over PowerShell. You have to tell it to. Uh, so in my testing, um, and I'm like waiting to see what Windows does over PowerShell, it doesn't do anything until you tell it to. So in certain environments, uh, detection for something like Empire is actually extremely easy. You just look for PowerShell communicating out of the network. That's it. Um, and then for other environments where maybe you are utilizing PowerShell for a certain thing, you know, managing servers or whatever, well then it's, it's still easy because you just whitelist those expected things that you're communicating to and just look for anything else. And it's really detecting things like Empire, that's, it, that's literally it. So if you see something that communicates over PowerShell and your environment doesn't utilize PowerShell for any reason, um, like a server environment or something like that, and you see something that communicates over PowerShell with the JAW3, then that's, that's an alert, easy. Um, what about custom targeted malware? Uh, so uh, I can't mention the name of this malware, but I can say that it was specifically targeted uh, to bypass our detection mechanisms. On our example <laughs> network? On, on our example network, yes. Uh, and it's, uh, it was, really obvious actually. So this is what the hello, uh, SSL hello packet looks like for that piece of malware. Um, and you can see it only has one cipher suite, one. Nothing has one cipher suite. Even the TrickBot malware had 12. Like nothing has one. Uh, so com completely obvious uh, and anomalous and very easy to detect. So it, was, uh, so it was basically like shooting fish in a barrel. Right, um, and in this instance, Jaw three was kind of like a silver bullet. So, uh, this is what it looks like. This was the Jaw three. The, here's the fingerprint string. Um, you got the version, single cipher, the list of extensions, and a single elliptic curve, which is also weird. Usually, there's three elliptic curves. So, thought that was interesting. The microphone needs to so let's go into hunting and analysis, and what we can do with alerts. Now, uh, John had the advantage of being able to look at source code and looking at what actually, you know, testing it out, knowing what's on the network. But let's see, let's see what happens if we receive a JAW3 and we don't know what it is. So this particular one, we know what it is. We know how John looked at it and found it. But let's look at the string down below. This is where the details are. The hash is, is the uniqueness for it, and then the string is what gives us the details. That's important. So we know that usually there's going to be multiple cipher suites this one has one. This one also has one support elliptical curve. There's usually at least three. And also there's no server name 
in here. So we know it's going directly to an IP, and usually SSL, that's, a, that's an unnavigable. So, so it's, it's important to note that uh, on our code that we open sourced, um, you can have Bro spit out the, uh, the fingerprint string. You just have to uncomment those lines. Uh, and if you're wondering, like, how do you, so detection is easy when you know what you're looking for, but how do you find that thing that you're looking for? Well, uh, if you use the fingerprint string, you can see that this is just anomalous. So you find, you know, looking at like like list of uh, ciphers and all the fingerprint strings, and you find one that only has one. Well, there you go. That's how you find those weirdnesses. Standard deviation. Put math on these. It works out really well. So let's talk about <clears throat> when we go out. We go out hunting. We're just looking at odd things on the network. Here we're looking at certificate subjects, and we're looking at the CN. And here we can see what looks like a domain-generated ge algorithm was used to create the domain, the CN. That's kind of interesting. So let's pivot down into that record, and let's see what we have. We have a single JAW 3, easy enough. We don't have anything, we don't have a client application associated with it. So we pivot on that particular client application, and now we can see the whole infrastructure that our clients are reaching out to. So this piece of software is going out to, uh, I don't know how many, how many we have here, if the list extends, but we have a lot of unique certificate subjects that are associated all with the DGA. Pretty interesting. So we can fingerprint, or we can, sorry, identify the whole infrastructure that they're reaching out to, but this also gives us the, the telemetry to look back into our network and see how big is this application installed across how many clients, and it gives us some ideas on how to track it down. Yeah, this is just a perfect example of, of what you can do with JAW3. So, uh, like, normally, um, I guess in the past, you would, like, try to get that DGA algorithm and then have it run a million times and then uh, search for all those different DGAs and stuff like that. But with this, you don't have to anymore. You can just look for the JAW3 for the client application and just let it fill out the, the list for you. <laughs> so, again, this is moving up that, that pyramid Focusing on the tool section, something that's harder or not as thought about um, for the actors to actually change. So, you move that slide? No, no, it's fine. Okay. So, even if we have clients that reach out, as long as they can establish a three way handshake, it's still going to send the hello packet. And at that point, we've got the fingerprint for it. So, it's easy to say, if an infrastructure isn't set up, or if we have misconfigured devices, or if there's things that are sinkhole, we can still fingerprint the client application, identify who's got it installed, and remediate from there. All right, so another way. So we looked at how do we pivot on that data. Let's talk about what else we can do with the JAW 3. We have an example for file detection. Exfil detection. No, sorry, exfil detection, thank you. So it transfers files outbound. The guys over at Reservoir Lab said, they're going to look at bytes transferred and what does it take to identify exfilled information from our network. <clears throat> so they wrote this in Bro, and we love Bro, so we're going, to, we're going to tweak it. So normally, traffic going out from a client is going to be pretty sporadic. You're going to see different bandwidth rates. Now, when you send a file over, you're going to see it, the bandwidth increase, you're going to see it spike, and then you're going to see it drop back down. Very indicative of a file being transferred. So what, they, what their thesis, or what actually works, is that they took the, the byte rate, as it increased, there's a threshold, and then as the total byte count increased, when it reaches a threshold, it starts to track it. And then when the file is completed and the byte rate drops below their threshold, it'll log it out. So that's awesome, it's great, it works really well, <coughs> and our friends at Dropbox will be able to say, yeah, we're easily able to see who transfer file, transfers files out there. Now this log gives us <coughs> enough to know for an analyst to say, okay, yeah, it looks like Dropbox, smells like Dropbox. Is it Dropbox? We don't know. Or is it a Dropbox application, better yet? So we decided to take the JAW3 string and the client application mappings and add that to the detection for the alerts. So now our analyst will be able to say, here's the alert, and we're gonna see it went to Dropbox, and then here we're going to see the JAW3 string, sorry, the JAW3 hash, and then the <coughs> client mapping that we have for it. This particular one, it is the Dropbox client, which is great. That means we know that someone's using a Dropbox client to go out and, and file, uh, transfer this file. Now, what happens if we have a hash that is unknown, 
And we don't have the client application. That's so, something unique, something we should look at. What if it's, uh, what if it's PowerShell? <laughs> PowerShell uploading files to Dropbox. That's odd. A user wouldn't do that normally. Right. So, and and so in in situations like that, maybe you would trigger a uh, an alert to your analyst. So it gives our analyst more context, more information to be able to address what is going on and understand the traffic quicker. So collisions can happen. Uh, we talked about the OS APIs for sandboxes, uh, PowerShell. We got to take that into consideration and in how the tools are built. If they're shared libraries. Uh, Python can be written to do all sorts of things, and I'm sure we're going to see some weird things coming out of Python. Yeah, it's, it's important to note that, uh, you know, a lot of our mappings are, are really, like, good, like, the Google Chrome, uh, uh, Jaw 3 is just, it's Chrome. Um, and then Tor is Tor, and, and uh, PowerShell is PowerShell, and so on and so forth. But some of the other ones can be a little bit more nebulous. Collisions can happen. Uh, like for our mapping, we're 99% sure, but we don't want to guarantee it because every environment is different. And uh, especially if you, if you have a lot of developers in your environment, maybe they built some tool that just happens to use the same libraries and the same build process and the same build server type as, as a piece of malware or something like that. So it's important to remember that collisions can happen. This isn't a 100% guarantee, but it's, it's pretty good. <laughs> so one of the things that we did when we were looking at how we were building the JAW3 string was what are the, the actual fields and extensions that we should add to it. Um, and some of them, we would get too granular and everything would be unique on our network. And sometimes we'd back some of those off and then we'd have a whole bunch of collisions. So we think we found a sweet spot and, and it's been successful so far. All right. All right, so let's talk about uh, JAW3S, uh, fingerprinting the server hello packet. Uh, so I actually didn't know what to expect here when I was diving into this. I just had an idea and I was like, I think there's more we can do with fingerprinting these SSL uh, sessions. So this was my hypothesis. My hypothesis was basically uh, that um, every server, SSL server, will respond to different clients differently, or may respond to different clients differently, but it will always respond to the same client the same. <laughs> Let me explain that. So uh, in this instance, a client is sending a hello packet to a server, all A's, and the server will respond, oh, hello A, let's talk A. Um, and then a, uh, a different client, this guy's left-handed, uh, will send a hello packet saying all B's, and then the server will respond, hello B, uh, let's talk B. Same server, uh, different um, reaction to the client hello packet, to a different client hello packet. However, every time it sees that, it should be the same. And so I tested this, I just picked a, a website on the internet, and, um, and on, the, on the top I have uh, one specific client, and on the bottom I have a different one. Jaw3 on the left, Jaw3S on the right. Uh, and I tried it four times over just to make sure, and you can see here that one client connecting to the same server the server always responds to that client exactly the same. Then I have a different client, and the server responds differently to that client, however, always the same to that one client. So how can we use this for detection? Um, so let's go back to Metasploit, and I, I know I talk about Metasploit a lot, but it's just, it's a tool that everyone's familiar with, um, and they work really hard to try to s stay so you can't detect them and whatnot. And, the point is not detecting Metasploit. The point is you can use these methods in detecting whatever malware or threat actor you're worried about. Uh, anyways, uh, so reverse when HTTPS. Um, this is what the server uh, hello looks like. Uh, latest version of Kali, latest version of Metasploit. This is what its, uh, its response is. And that's uh, our JAW3S hash for it. So if we were to detect, try to detect just based on the JAW3 for Windows 10 interpreter where it's communicating out that API, actually communication out of that Windows API is, is pretty rare. However, when you have uh, 100,000 systems and, and an example network, um, rare is relative. So detection based on that is uh, it's not very good. Um, what about that Kali Metasploit JAW3S? Yes. Could we just detect on that? Well, there are some false positives. Some things respond similarly, so detection there is uh, maybe, maybe not so good. But if we combine the two, uh, it turns out that it never happens in this example network of 100,000 systems. Um, 
And so detection for something like Metasploit reverse when HTTPS is literally, literally this simple. This is it. Uh, you look for this JAW3, which is the client application fingerprint, and then this JAW3S, which is the server application fingerprint. And, um, and those two together in one SSL session uh, is anomalous enough that it's a, a perfect uh, hit. You know, it's, it's just, that's the detection for Metasploit, easy. Uh, and it doesn't matter what the server certificate is or, or if, you know, they got, if the Social Engineering Toolkit, which uses uh, Metasploit as its backend, if you use that and you build out the most realistic looking SSL cert, it doesn't matter, this will detect it. It's pretty awesome. So uh, I know what you might be thinking. Uh, we've open sourced JAW3, so you might be thinking, how about JAW3S? Yes, give me that code. <laughs> give it to me now. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> I made, made a PowerPoint GIF. Um, it's, I know there's more that we can do to, uh, to fingerprint the SSL server. Uh, and right now all I'm doing really is just collecting the, the version for the server hello packet, the, uh, the list or the cipher that it accepted and then the list of extensions and that's it really. Uh, but the, I know there's a lot more that can be done here. Uh, I think that there's a way that we could probably get it set up so that you could fingerprint servers just by scanning the internet with like a, a specially crafted client hello packet just to see how the server responds. Um, so I don't want to open source it yet. I'm actually looking for feedback from the community. Um, I know some of you have already solved this, but might not be able to talk about it. But um, I'm looking for I'm looking for feedback uh, to see what we can do to to make. JAW3S more granular and just really uh, precise um, fingerprinting for uh, server SSL servers. So in conclusion, uh, JAW3 is not a silver bullet uh, because collisions can happen and applications can connect through operating system APIs. Uh, if you wanted to bypass JAW3, if you're a red teamer or something like that, just use you know the operating system API rather than writing your own special custom malware. Um, and, and it's important to note that there can be up to like five JAW 3s for the same application. You saw Google Chrome up there a lot and a lot of different uh, fingerprints for it and that's because you know, you have one JAW 3 for uh, if it's communicating direct to an IP, another one if it's communicating to a server name, uh, another one if it's a renegotiation session, stuff like that. However, malware usually just has one. So it's, it's still really uh, good for, for just general malware. Uh, it's always valuable to pivot as a pivot point for analysis. You could think of, uh, of JAW 3 kind of like the, um, the finger, no, the, uh, the, uh, and an HTTP session, the user agent string, yeah. So you could kind of think of it as a user agent string. Back in the day, that used to be pretty good. You could utilize that for detection. Now, not so much, but this is kind of like that. This is, you know, uh, some of it is really good, really solid, uh, easy detection than others. It's utilizing something that, you know, other programs use, so maybe not so great for detection, but still a good pivot point for analysis. Another note is, JAW3 is a silver bullet, sometimes. Um, in that example where, Malware was written, you know, specifically to target our environment, specifically to bypass our detection mechanisms. It was, at, it was shooting fish in a barrel. It was super easy to detect. So in those, in those instances, yeah, it can be your single only detection mechanism. Uh, so it's important to note that each environment is different. And this is kind of why uh, a lot of people want us to release a blacklist but I'm hesitant to do that because each environment is different. What would work as a blacklist for some people in some environments may not work for a different environment, uh, most likely like with a lot of developers doing crazy things. So it depends. Uh, and JAW3S adds even more context. I'm so excited about this. I really want to get this nailed down and, and release it so that all the detection is you know, JAW3 and this JAW3S and the same uh, session equals this happened. So, uh, so please uh, contribute, uh, do pull requests, uh, or you know, come up with your own program based on some of this information. This is why we're releasing it, because uh, like we said, this is not a new concept. Uh, but, and a lot of people, I know people have come up with this type of detection mechanism at different companies and organizations, uh, but they kept it close to the chest. They didn't want to share it because they didn't want to know, they didn't want everyone to know what their capabilities were. Um, but what 
that ends up doing is causing the industry and all of us in, in security to just end up developing the exact same thing in silos. And so when we're all developing the wheel in a silo, how long is it going to take us to create the carriage? So please uh, help us to push the industry forward. Um, so where so, can you get JAW3 now? So we, we initially released this uh, seven or eight months ago. And we've been surprised at how quickly it's taken off. And there's integration in network detection tools like Moloch and Bro. Suricata has a pull request, so it should be hopefully getting through the process pretty soon. There's proxies like Nginx in here that's using it. So the distribution platform that's in front of our infrastructures can help enumerate some of this information. Uh, there's the MISP. Uh, it's, Thread Intel platform, we can actually start using it as a formal IOC so we can start integrating into our alert and, and our sims and everything. So it's, it's really taking hold. Yeah, so I talked to the guys at Darktrace. They do this, uh, uh, it's machine learning for network analytics type thing, um, and they're using it uh, very successfully. Uh, I can't say exactly how they're using it. They wouldn't let me, but uh, but it is pretty awesome what they're doing. They did show me. It was, it was super cool. So, uh, yeah, and then obviously anything that runs Bro um, can run JAW3 because uh, that command down there at the bottom, Bro package install JAW, if you have Bro on your network, run that command, and it installs JAW3, and that's it. Uh, so pretty easy to deploy. And again, our GitHub link is there. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, contact me or Jeff. Uh, if you have any ideas on JAW3S, uh, hit me up. Uh, if you want to follow my Twitter, I will post the uh, slides and whatnot. Uh, but that's it. Good. I, I think we might have a minute for question. Right, do I have a sense of uh, a percentage of malware that has a unique job three versus using an OS API? Uh, not, not reliably, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna make a guess uh, because it would just be a guess. However, um, uh, Virus Total has been open to including job three in their paid service. Uh, and so it's really just a matter of getting them to deploy it, and then I think we would have a lot more data. So if you are a Virus Total customer, contact your account manager and say, hey, can we get that JAW3 thing? <laughs> Did I look at other packets as well? N no, I just looked at the, uh, the hello packets. Uh, that's it. Um, but, but there's, I agree with you, there's more that can be done um, and if you have some ideas, like send them over and build something. In the back. Yes. Uh, it, so JAW3, does JAW3 work with TLS 1.3? From what we've seen, it looks like TLS 1.3 is going to fake a server extension with that information, so we should be able to maintain that. Yeah, the, the weird thing, yes, it will work with TLS 1.3, uh, but like Jeff said, uh, the weird thing with 1.3 is that the version and the hello packet will actually still say TLS 1.2, and then there will be an extension that says TLS 1.3. However, it's still going to produce a unique fingerprint, so, yep. uh, so yes, it works. And, and while I was reading the RFCs and trying not to fall asleep, I actually saw that there's different ciphers that are basically recommended or required at the beginning. So there's also that. Any other questions? Okay, cool.